chapter 126 through 38. Those who are able stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And today the word of the Lord reads in the King James text. And in the sixth month, which by the way is not uh, December, not even on the Jewish calendar, and this is going by the Jewish calendar, okay. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of, salu of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, <coughs> seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. It is Christmas time. It is that time of year when we remember and we celebrate the incarnation. That is, we celebrate the coming of God into the realms of flesh and into the realms of humanity. It would be easy today for this preacher to preach a message that focuses on the incarnation and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and that sort of a thing. My problem is I seek the direction of the Holy Ghost when I preach. And that is not altogether the direction the Lord has given me. You see, this story and this event holds for us some very important lessons. It holds for us some very important truths that go beyond merely the arrival of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, beyond the arrival of the one that the angel said twice to Mary, listen carefully, the one who would be called the Son of God. It's important to pay attention to the fact that the angel said he shall be called the Son of God. Why? Well, because he is going to be a man whose only father he claims and Mary claims is God Almighty. Therefore, he is going to be called the Son of God. That does not take away from the fact that in truth, according to Isaiah, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, 
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you follow? So you got to understand, Son of God is a title. That is something you call somebody. It is not a position in the Trinity. It is a title. Okay? And from a human perspective, Jesus Christ the man is and was the Son of God. From a human perspective. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. Christmas is a time to contemplate not only the issue of the Incarnation, it is also a time to contemplate the important issue of submission. Are we fully committed today to submitting ourselves to God's plan for our lives? God often interrupts our lives with an experience or a path that is completely life-changing. You ever had God interrupt your life? You ever had a circumstance interrupt your life, Martin, when you had a house and you had all kinds of things going and all of a sudden something happened and, whoops, life is interrupted. Everything changes. All of a sudden, in a moment's time, everything changed. Lisa, you ever had a stroke where your life was interrupted and all of a sudden, in a moment's time, everything was changed and everything was interrupted? Have you ever had an interruption, Bill and Johnny, where a friend who was dying came to stay with you and all of a sudden, your whole life was interrupted, your whole life was changed? But you see, the important thing about interruptions that God allows to come into our lives and that God puts into our lives is whether or not we're walking to please ourselves or whether or not we're walking to please the Lord. Whether or not we're walking to bring glory to ourselves. I'm going to tell you, the people who complain the most about interruptions in their lives, Lisa, are people who are living for themselves. My Lord, have mercy. Because if you're living to glorify God, the Word of God said uh, that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Word of God said that we are to glorify, therefore glorify God with your, in your mortal bodies. If we're living, Martin, to glorify God, then we should see these interruptions differently then we see them if we're living unto ourselves. The angel came to Mary and said, Mary, you have found favor with God. Why? Because Mary was holier than anybody else on the planet. Mary was the only woman, the only virgin on the planet. No, Mary would have to have been alive in 2018 to probably be the last virgin. No, it wasn't that Mary was the only available virgin. It wasn't that Mary was the only godly virgin. It wasn't that Mary was the only commanded virgin who loved the Lord. But there were probably many that God could have chosen. The only problem is he wasn't trying to have a harem. He was trying to have a kid. He had to pick one. So the angel came to Mary and said, Mary, thou art highly favored. Well, why is that? Well, because God had to pick one, and he picked you. What in the world may have helped to determine Mary's worthiness over others? Again, not that she would even be the only one who met this criteria. It might have been that Mary was one who lived to glorify God. And therefore, when word came to Mary of something as interruptive and disruptive and life-changing as the birth of a baby in spite of her virgin status, Mary was willing still to say, according to the word of the Lord, so be it unto me. Hallelujah. Whatever God says, let it happen. 
You see, you don't understand what it was like back in the first century. You don't understand what it was like for this young woman who was a spouse. She was engaged to be married. And all of a sudden, she's interrupted by an angel of God. As God fills her in on his plan for her. Notice God didn't have to ask Mary if she was willing to do this. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Did you notice the angel didn't come and say, Mary, God would like to do this. Would you be willing? No, God knows our hearts. He knows in advance whether or not we're in a place to glorify him in our mortal body and to do what needs to be done in spite of whatever negative repercussions that might bring upon us. I prayed for years. And believe me, I've, I've wondered many times, Lord, should I have been praying that prayer? I probably shouldn't have because I didn't think about what that prayer was going to bring into my life. But for many, many years before I came out, I used to get into the altar and I would pray, Lord, pour my life out on the altar of sacrifice. Ooh. Ooh, boy. I should have said, Lord, um, use me. <laughs> Lord, use me. But pour my life out on the altar of sacrifice. God has many times come along, Lisa, and interrupted my life with something and said, um, didn't you say pour your life out on the altar of sacrifice? I'm pouring. Diabetes, I'm pouring. Hello now, leukemia, I'm pouring. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The difference is, am I living to bring glory to myself or am I living to bring glory to God? Mm -hmm. That's what makes all the difference in the world. Makes all the difference in the world. How we react and how we respond to life's interruptions is based on whether or not we are living unto ourselves or we are living to glorify God. Mary was willing. She knew the moment this angel announced God's plan. She knew, oh my goodness, that this is not going to be an easy road. The ladies in town, the ladies at the temple, the ladies at synagogue are going to have a party with this. Me, a virgin, having a baby. And then on top of that, claiming God did it. <laughs> Boy, are they going to get a chuckle. Boy, I can just see all the joke memes that are going to be out there on Facebook about me. <laughs> yes, this girl had a baby without ever knowing a man. Without ever being with a fella, she's having a baby. Uh, I remember years ago, a lady that we knew through our church... I, we didn't know her real well. She wasn't part of our church on a regular basis, but she gave birth to a black child. She was not a black woman. She claimed, Lisa, that the reason she gave birth to a black child was because while she was pregnant, she was taking these black pills. <laughs> Needless to say... <laughs> A lot of people chuckled. <laughs> a lot of people had a laugh. Well, honey, I'm going to tell you something. If they can laugh at this woman claiming she had a black baby, all because she was taking black pills, then you can just imagine what Mary, what kind of a response Mary got when she said, I'm having a baby and I've never been with a man. Can you imagine? She's going to have to have an awful awkward conversation with Joseph. What will Joseph's reaction be? See, there's something about Joseph that we don't take into consideration either. In order for Mary to be highly favored, listen to me carefully now, mm -hmm. Joseph had to be well thought of by God as well. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. How do you like that? Yeah. In order for Mary to be mm -hmm. highly favored, Joseph had to be very well thought of by God as well. One of the things that made Mary stand out from the crowd was that she had a good godly husband. 
she had a husband who also would be willing to live to glorify God. Nothing will ruin a marriage faster than the wife being willing to glorify God and the husband not. Hello now. Or the husband willing to glorify God and the wife not. Or one of us in a partnership, one of us in a uh, relationship being willing to glorify God and the other one having personal ambitions and personal desires. I've seen a lot of relationships go down in flames because there was a disparity in that equation. But Joseph must have been an awful good man as well. And when God was looking, he'd say, well, this woman over here, Martha, she's an awful good woman. You know what? But that guy she's with, that fellow she's engaged to, no. If, if I was to try to use her, their relationship would fall apart. He would privately, quietly put her away. Hello now. And that would be the end. And, and I don't want this child coming into the world without a father because doesn't have anything to do with the better families or those that have a father and a mother. No, the mother determined his Jewish heritage because Jewish heritage is determined through the mother. It's not determined through the father. Like many nationalities and many uh, different things, they determine your heritage through the father. But in the case of Judaism, the system is set up by God so that your heritage is determined through the mother. So Jesus, in order for him to come and save, quote, his people from their sins, in order to be part of his people, in order to be part of the Jewish race, he had to come through a Jewish mother. However, in order for him to qualify to sit on the throne of David, he had to be adopted by a man who was of the lineage of David. Did you notice what we read this afternoon? Joseph was of the lineage of David. So this is why it was important that there be both a father and a mother. It didn't have anything to do with that this is a better family than a family that has only a mother or a family that has only a father or a family that has two mothers or two fathers. No, it had to do with the fact in order to meet all the prophetic criteria, he had to have a mother who was Jewish and a adopted father. Because remember, when you adopt a child, that child... They become heir to everything that you have as though they were blood. Mm -hmm. So when Joseph chose to raise this child, when he chose to marry Mary in spite of her pregnancy prior to their marriage, he was adopting Jesus and thus making Jesus an heir to the throne of David. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Amen. Isn't that interesting? Don't you love that? Isn't it wonderful how God works? I'm going to tell you, I, I've many times thought about how people question the Christian faith and they question religion and they think it's all a bunch of bunk and it doesn't make any sense to them. And I've thought about it and I said, they just don't understand how complex the web of prophecy and prophecy fulfilled is. They don't understand, Lisa, that in the Old Testament prophets, there are prophecies that we later read through the history of Israel that are fulfilled to the letter and how that even the arrival of Jesus, it fulfilled specific prophecies to such a degree. Bethlehem was a tiny, tiny farming community. It was not any great city. It was not any great place. The likelihood that the Messiah, which the prophecy said he would be born in Bethlehem, the likelihood of someone of great notoriety and someone who had accomplished great things coming out of Bethlehem was pretty small. Well, guess what? Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. But thankfully, Joseph was from Bethlehem. And when the taxation time came, he had to return to his hometown 
in order to pay his taxes, in order to be counted in the census. And it was during that trip home to pay taxes and to be accounted that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. What are the likelihood of that? What are the chances of that? And you want to know something really wonderful? You want to hear something really cool? Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem, literally translates a house of bread. Mm. Now there's another way you could say that. A bakery. A place where bread is baked. <laughs> now listen, if this don't make you want to be Pentecostal for a minute, I don't know what will. Jesus comes and Jesus says, I am the bread, hallelujah, which came down from heaven, glory to God. Where would the bread of life be born but in a city that is called the house of bread, hallelujah. Whoo! isn't that exciting? I told you a little while ago the likelihood of Jesus being born in December is one in a trillion or so. The Bible tells us plainly he was born in the sixth month. The sixth month in the Hebrew calendar would put him in the spring. It would also put him at the beginning of a season. You see, you've got to understand the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is divided up in seasons, but it is also divided up spiritually. Each season represents something different. This is why the various Jewish holidays, Yom Kippur and the Passover and what have you, this is why all these holidays occur at the time of year that they occur. Jesus was born at the beginning of the season of redemption. Well, doesn't that make sense? He's the redeemer. Doesn't it make sense he'd be born? But listen, listen, listen. I'm telling you, it gets exciting, folks. So I said, if you don't believe this Bible and you don't believe this Christian message, it's because you don't know enough about it. But notice the angel tells Mary, by the way, your cousin, she also is having a baby. The only difference is hers isn't from God. It's a miracle because her husband's old, she's old. It's a miracle, but he's already six months in the oven. So he'll be six months older than your baby. Guess what season John was born at the start of? What was John's message? Repentance. Guess what season John was born at the start of? The season of repentance. Hallelujah. So you see, when you understand these things, you understand. I'm telling, whoo, man, that makes me want to shout a little bit. That makes me want to dance a little bit. Whoo, God knows what he's doing, honey. There is nothing, there is no way in the world you could put all these things together over the course of thousands of years. This is not, nobody sat down and wrote the Bible in one setting. No, you're thinking of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> the Bible is written by dozens of authors. Prophecies were given by dozens of men and women. Honey, that book is a compilation of dozens of books. <coughs> there is no way in the world you could put this whole scenario together and make it work out the way it worked out. There's just no way. But you know, God has a way <laughs> of interrupting our lives. And with those interruptions come great opportunity for us to bring glory and to bring honor to his name. When interruptions come our way, instead of saying, why me, Lord? We ought to be saying, use me, Lord. When I fell so sick in 2000, and I was lying on my deathbed in Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut, 
little did I know that God was, it seemed like he'd quit hearing me pray. It seemed like he had just given up on me and I, I wasn't going to get any kind of a miracle. That's what it looked like. I'm sure it looked like that to Elizabeth and her husband as well. They prayed for a baby and no baby came. But guess what? God had other plans. They were going to get a baby. It was just going to come at an unlikely time. Well, my miracle came at an unlikely time. God said, no, it's not that I'm not going to give you a miracle. I'm just going to hold it off till you're ready to die. I'm going to hold it off until every scientist and every doctor has determined that you haven't got a hope in the world of surviving. I'm going to wait until I can shock the scientific community and shock the medical community with your recovery. Because after all, it's not about you, Charles. <laughs> Hello now. It's not about you, Johnny. It's not about you, Bill. It's about me. See, I'm using you. You are chess pieces in my game. I'm using you. I'm not, I'm not abusing you, but I'm using you. I want to show people that I'm real. I want to show people that I'm true. I want to show people that I'm alive. I want to show people that God is not merely the figment of men's imaginations, but that I am a real and living entity. And the only way I can do that is when I use people who believe in me, who trust me, who know how and are willing to submit to me. That's the only way God can show the unbeliever that he's real. Who's he going to use, Johnny, to show he's real? The unbeliever? Yeah. The guy that doesn't believe in him? The guy that has no concept of God? No. He's got to use those of us who do believe in him. Why does this come into my life? Because God's trying to bring glory to himself. Hang in there. Hang in there. I remember when I woke up the, mo the morning after the 4th of July, we had gone and had a little party at... Uh, one of our church members' houses for the 4th of July. And I woke up the next morning and I was deaf as a doorknob in my left ear, I believe it was. And I, and I noticed that as I was trying to listen to things, the TV and what have you, I, that sound was coming at me very strangely and I, I couldn't hear very well. And finally it dawned on me, block out my right ear. And when I did, I could not hear a thing. I mean, Martin... I could not hear a thing. When I blocked out my right ear, I could hear nothing, and I mean nothing, through my left ear. Scared the life out of me. My first thought was, maybe I have water in the ear. So I went to the store and I got some stuff, you know, you put in your ear to get water out of your ear, and I got stuff to get wax out of your ear, you know. I tried every remedy that you could get at CVS over the <coughs> counter. Nothing worked. My next reaction was, I called Brother Jack. I said, we're going to go up to that church over here in Garland, and I'm going to ask them to anoint me with oil and pray. This is within a day or two of this happening. I said, I've tried the over-the-counter re remedies, and they're not working. I said, let, let me go to the church and get prayed for. So I went up to the church, I got prayed for. And because the preacher didn't pull his hand away and immediately I could hear the preacher, you could see the countenance on his face fall. My God, people, how small do you think God is? You think God's only going to do a miracle the way you anticipate he's going to do a miracle? You better get out of that, that frame of thinking. You better quit looking at things that way. No, God's going to do the miracle the way God wants to do the miracle so that he gets the full and complete glory. Well, when they got done praying, I couldn't hear anything still. And here I am, the guy that got prayed for, and I'm telling the preacher, don't worry. You've done what God told us for you to do. I've done what God said for me to do. I said, God's going to take care of it. He's just going to do it however he's going to do it. <laughs> Went to the ear specialist, had my ear checked out, and I'll never forget, he told me, he said, I'm sorry. He said, you've got permanent damage to the nerve in your ear. He said, this is common as people get older. He said, uh, you probably 
well, excuse me, you will never hear again through your left ear without the assistance perhaps of a, uh, what do you call, hearing aid. He said, even with a hearing aid, uh, you may never hear. He said, I don't know. We'll have to see if a hearing aid will assist you or not. He said, I've got one treatment that we can try. He said, but I'm going to be honest with you. I've been down this road with hundreds of patients. If we do this treatment, we are doing it for one reason and one reason only, and that is so that later you cannot say, well, we didn't try everything we could try. He said, but I can tell you that if we do this treatment, I do not anticipate any change. Isn't that what he said, Booby? He said, I do not anticipate any change whatsoever. My life was interrupted. Boy, I mean to tell you, was it interrupted? Was I? Oh, you have no idea how hard it was for a few months for me to go about with a deaf left ear, trying to lead the worship service, Lisa, was horrible. I couldn't hear the music. I couldn't hear my own voice well enough through my right ear. I literally put a earphone in my ear with a wire, because I didn't have wireless at the moment, and as I was leading the worship service, that would feed the sound into my right ear loud enough where I could really hear it good, so I could try to sing and lead worship and do what I had to do. It was so frustrating, it was so aggravating. It was, honestly, it was one of the worst experiences I've ever been through in my life, and I kept thinking, Lord, I know you're gonna take care of this. I said to Tommy, I said, God's gonna take care of this. I don't know when, I don't know how, but God's going to take care of this, didn't he? Mm -hmm. See, when you understand you're living for God's glory, instead of falling into a pity party and letting your faith go down the toilet, when you understand that you're living for God's glory, then you can know that God's going to do something big. God's going to use this in a big way. Mary knew that no matter what she went through, God was going to do something big. He was going to use her to accomplish something big. That meant she was going to go through a lot of heartache. Mm -hmm. Meant she was going to go through a lot of humiliation. It meant she was going to live a life, a life of embarrassment. I went for months. I had to go two weeks and two weeks and two weeks to get a shot through my eardrum to inject a... Uh, steroid into my ear, behind my eardrum. They literally had to stick a needle through the eardrum. You want to talk about painful folks? Tommy was with me at least once when I did it. And I'd have to lay on this table and they had me like this, you know, and tears were just streaming down my face. It hurt so bad, remember? I, oh, I hurt. God, that hurt. And weeks passed, and I said to Tommy, I said, do you know what? I said, I might be crazy, but I swear I'm beginning to hear something through my left ear. I, I said, now look, you know, I said, I'm, I'm beginning to hear something. It was still cloudy. It was still not perfectly clear, but I said, I can hear something through my left ear. He said, really? Good J.W. boy, born and raised J.W., you know. He's like, yeah, uh -huh, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever you say, Charles. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you don't know this boy. There ain't nothing in the universe can excite him. That's one thing I love about people born and raised in that organization. They become so distanced from their emotions, it's not even funny. Ain't nothing in the universe excite him. So every response I get, I'm excited. He's like, mm-hmm, okay. Sure. I'm hoping somebody's going to get as excited as I am. But, you know, he's not experiencing it like I am. He's not feeling it and hearing it like I am. So, you know, he's probably thinking, oh, it's all in his head. You know, he's lip reading and figuring he's hearing something, you know. Martin, after the third shot, you know, after all that, had to go back again. And they had... Uh, I told the doctor, I said, I can hear through my left ear. He said, really? He said, cover your ear. I cover my ear. He said some things. I repeated it back to him. He said, my God. He <laughs> said, you know what? Let's wait another month and see what happens. Waited another month. Went back. He said, all right, we're going to do a full hearing exam. I have to go in this little 
phone booth type mm -hmm. box, you know, and they they uh, play these sounds, and I have to acknowledge when I hear the sound, you know, so on and so forth. I have to be able to tell them whether the sound's coming from the left or the right, which you cannot do when you're hearing through only one ear, I promise you. You don't know where that sound's coming from. Honest to God, I had one time I was driving down the road while I was going through that, I heard an ambulance coming up. I thought it was coming from the road over here, and I'm sitting there at the stoplight, and I'm hearing an ambulance coming from, and I'm looking for the ambulance. All of a sudden, the full thing drove up beside me to the left. <laughs> but when you have only one good ear, that's what happens. Sound is coming in. You have no idea where it's coming from. So I, it, that's what I mean. It was a pain in the neck, Johnny, to go through that experience. You don't know what's going on. You, you know, you hear a siren. You have no clue where it's coming from. Well waited a month. I went for the hearing test. I went in that little booth. I did the hearing test. I went out and the, went back to the doctor's uh, waiting room. And they called me and said, listen, the doctor had to go to the hospital on an emergency. He will not be back in time to give you your test results. He said, uh, uh, go on home and he will call you with the results. I had the message, because he called and left a message. I didn't answer the phone when he called. If I don't recognize the number, I don't answer. I don't like all them sales calls and foolishness. He left a message. I played the message. You know how we started it? He said, hello there, Superman. That's how he started his message, didn't he, Booby? He said, I've got some good news to tell you. He said, according to your hearing test, listen to this. He said, you have had a 97% recovery. 97% recovery. This was not a general practitioner, honey. This was a ear specialist. This is the same man who sat there and told me I would be deaf in my left ear for the rest of my life. This is the same man who told me they would try to fit me for a hearing aid and see if that might help at all. This is the same man who told me that they would do this treatment, but he anticipated zero result. Now he's telling me, I don't know what happened. But you've had a 97% recovery. When that interruption came into my life, just like Gabriel meeting up with Mary to tell her she was going to have a baby, God didn't ask for my permission. Amen. Had he asked me, I promise you I'd have said no. <clears throat> Hello now. The Lord had asked you to take care of certain people in their dying deathbed. You'd have probably said, Lord, I'd rather not. If the Lord had asked you if you'd mind going through a car wreck and having your leg all mangled up and ruined so that a doctor can see that I'm real, so that that female doctor could see that God is real, you'd have probably said, thank you, Lord, but I'll pass. That's why God don't ask us permission. He just lets us know what he's doing. Hello now. Now, it just comes. It just happens. Our life is interrupted. But if we trust him, if we'll submit to him, if we'll yield to him, if we'll not become bogged down in self-pity, if we'll not become bogged down in lack of faith, if we'll maintain our faith and believe that the word of God promises all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called Listen, according to his purpose. I know preachers, when things come into their lives and they experience an interruption in their life, they act so mad and aggravated and frustrated. You know why? Because they're not living to glorify God. The Lord interrupted my life 25 years ago. He said, I want you to start an affirming ministry. I said, oh, dear God. <laughs> I'm going to be the devil. I'm going to be labeled the Antichrist. I'm going to be the laughing stock of the apostolic Pentecostal community. I'm going to be made fun of. I'm going to be ridiculed, Lord. Well, then on top of that, there's always things that we didn't anticipate either. 
Little did I know that when I came into the movement, I was going to find out there were a bunch of other preachers in the movement who were screwing around and playing games. And, and when I spoke out against it, Lisa, all of a sudden I was going to have enemies from within my own camp. I didn't know that. That was new to me. That was news to me. Hello now. I'm sure Mary experienced some things she wasn't anticipating from the start. I'm sure things came along after a while, and she said, well, you know, I knew people were going to make fun of me. I knew people were going to laugh at me, but I didn't expect this. Hello now. There were things that came, Martin, after I started my firm. There, were, there was a lot of things I anticipated, but there was a lot of junk that came that I never anticipated. Here I am 25 years later. I'm still preaching. I'm still preaching to a pretty small audience. I'd like to have, oh, two or three hundred times as many as we've got in here today. I can just imagine what kind of church we'd be having. Ooh, I'm telling you. But you know what, Johnny, I'm not living to bring glory to myself. It's not about me being able to brag about how big a church I've built. It's not about me bragging about how many people want to come to church every Sunday and listen to me preach. No, I'm not living for me. I'm living for him. Amen. Whatever whatever God is doing, he's doing it according to his purpose. Hallelujah. And I've just got to be willing to submit and surrender and let God do what God's doing. Hallelujah. And whoever God's helping, well, so be it. However God's doing it, then so be it. Hallelujah. It's not my life. It's his. Amen. The word of God said, the life that I now live, I live through Christ. See, after you become born again, your life changes. You're not living for yourself anymore. It's not your life anymore. It's God's life. It's not your body anymore. It's God's body. Don't you know, Paul said, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? It's not your body anymore. It's not your life anymore. It's God's. So my job, Lisa, is to surrender, to submit to the will and purpose of God. I'm trying to close today. Mary's life was interrupted by an angel with news of a plan that would include much pain, rejection, sorrow, and grief. But at the same time, this plan would offer great reward and blessing. Many Christians want to believe that any plan God has for them is bordered with flowers and butterflies. Huh? How many Christians you know, right? If God's in it, then everything's going beautiful. The minute anything goes off the tracks, the minute your life gets interrupted, you're no longer in the will of God. Baloney. Chances are, the whole time you're walking with butterflies and flowers, you're not in God's will. That's, that's where the problem is. God is in the interruptions. Hello now. Did you hear what the preacher just said? God is in the interruptions. See, people see you living a good life. People see you blessed. They don't see God in that. They say, no, I know sinners who live blessed. I know sinners who live well. I know sinners who can pay their bills. I know sinners who can eat at nice restaurants. I know sinners who drive Cadillacs and Rolls Royce and Bentley. So all those things, that doesn't prove God's real to me. No, so God has to bring interruptions into our life in order to make himself real to an unbelieving world. Do you hear what I'm telling you? So although we, act, we understand and we recognize God is in the good times, but God needs to use those interruptions to demonstrate himself to the unbeliever. So God is in the interruptions. Don't you ever think for a minute because things aren't going perfectly, because things aren't going just exactly the way you'd like them to, that, oh, I'm, I must be off to step with God. I must be out of the will of God. No, 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 honey. You may very well be more in the will of God at this moment than you've ever been in your entire life. And you know what? It ain't over. It's not finished. 
The Bible said the ending is better than the beginning. Hallelujah. Don't worry about what you're going through today, Martin, because it ain't over. The old saying, it ain't over until the fat lady sings. <laughs> Amen. And the fat lady ain't sung yet. Truth today is that there is bitterness mixed with all sweetness. You want chocolate to taste right? You want to bake <laughs> you some chocolate chip cookies? I got news for you, honey. The same recipe that calls for chocolate chips and sugar also calls for salt. <coughs> Hello now. Now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of LGBT people today, so I know y'all bake. <laughs> <laughs> boys, girls, and boys who think they're girls, and girls who think they're boys. Uh, it, I got news for you today. There's bitterness in everything. Hello now. Now everything isn't all sweetness and cream. Everything isn't wonderful at all times. No, there's a little salt in even the sweetest stuff. Recipes. Am I telling the truth today? God's plan may be fraught with difficulties and struggles, and yet the eternal rewards may far outweigh the temporal pains and trials. If you embrace the thought that the plan of God for your life is filled with praise, adoration, and admiration, you are likely not looking realistically at the plan. See, Mary could have looked at the plan and said, Oh, everybody's going to think I'm wonderful. Everybody's going to think that I'm just the most terrific woman. Why, the Catholic Church is going to deify me. <laughs> but you know what? If she'd have thought that, she wouldn't have been looking at things realistically. Because what she was going to live was going to be very different than that. Mary, by the time Catholicism turned you into a member of the Godhead, you're dead and buried, girl. You don't know nothing about that. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 48. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judea and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Hallelujah. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul, oh, 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 believer, if only we could react like this. Listen to what Mary said. She said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Hallelujah! She didn't say, boy, am I going to get a lot of adulation. Boy, am I going to get a lot of praise. Boy, are people going to think a lot about me. She said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Mary, it's that attitude that made you highly favored. Don't forget the man in this world that we have in Scripture who experience more pain and loss and destruction more than any man that we have recorded. His name was Job. But you know how Job's story started? Started with Lucifer, Satan standing before God. See, you forget, folks. Even the devil has to still answer to God. 
The Bible said the sons of men were presenting themselves before God. And, excuse me, the sons of God, the angels. Lucifer still an angel. And he still has to make an occasional report. And he stood before the Lord. And you know how Job's story started? Didn't start with the devil saying, hey, how about this man, Job? No, it started with God saying, hey, I've got somebody down there, listen to me, children, who is blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah! How about Job? Have you seen my servant Job? God was bragging on Job. When you're going through a bunch of hardships and trials and all kinds of interruptions in your life, consider this. God's been bragging about you. <laughs> God's been saying, this boy can handle it. This girl can handle it. Devil, you throw as many darts as you want to, and you know what that fellow's going to do? He's going to keep saying, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Hallelujah. Throw anything you want my way. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be upon my lips. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Got a lot of junk going on in my body right now. <laughs> Got a lot of stuff going on in my life right now. But I promise you, as Tommy and I rode to and from Oklahoma last night to visit the country, I wasn't griping. <laughs> I wasn't complaining about what was happening. I was singing the songs of Zion. I was singing the songs of praise. Wasn't that booby? Hallelujah. Because my soul doth magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Whatever's going on, it doesn't matter because I'm not living for me. It's not about me having a comfortable life. It's not about me receiving a bunch of awards and praise and appreciation and adulation. Thank God because that's not coming. It's about me submitting and surrendering to the will of God. Because when it's all said and done and I leave this life, I hope that my life has said, God is real. Trust him. Jesus is real. Believe in him. The gospel is true. Believe it. Obey it. I hope that's what my life says. I don't care if I'm ever rich. I don't care if I ever own a mansion. This is where I'm in a, a marriage that is unequally yoked. We're coming home last night from Oklahoma, Tommy said. One day, up in that mountain over there, I'm going to build me a big old mansion, a big old gorgeous mansion, and it's going to overlook that lake right there. And oh, everybody's going to realize, I said, yeah, everybody's going to realize that a pretentious Dallas site is in Oklahoma. <laughs> That's what everybody's going to do. <laughs> now, I'm teasing him, because my booby is not, I promise you, he is not a... Uh, materialistic person that way. But, you know, he was just goofing around and goofing. But that's not what we're living our lives for. That fellow works his rear end off to support me and help me so that I can do what I'm doing. If I didn't have him, I couldn't be standing here today doing what I'm doing. So we're working together to bring glory to God. We're working together to make sure we accomplish the mission that God has called us to accomplish. Do you understand me today, folks? Amen. God is in the interruptions. Almost done, I promise. I'm trying to pull it together. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all nations shall call me blessed. So Mary could see a light at the end of the tunnel. She said, for everything I go through, there's going to be something good come out of it. 
I won't be here to enjoy it, but people are going to look back and say, boy, that woman was blessed. Mary could not understand the mechanics of God's plan, but she knew that whatever path he desired for her to walk, he had the power to make it happen. Has God asked you today to live with some disability? Has he asked you to walk through an illness, a sickness, or a disease? Has he asked you to be the mother of a child with special needs? Has he asked you to be married to a man or a woman with severe physical limitations? Whatever the path God has set before us, are we prepared to submit ourselves, like young Mary, to his will for us? Seeing the good and yet looking beyond the pain and struggle, are we committed to bringing glory to God with our lives, or are we more interested in protecting our reputations, our comforts, our conveniences, <coughs> or our own objectives? Joseph likely never imagined that he would be marrying a young woman who would forever bear the shame of conceiving a child outside of wedlock. He probably never anticipated that his young virgin wife would bring a child into the world who was not his blood offspring, and that he would spend his days raising a child who had a mission in life far more important than that of any child before or after him. Lastly, today, Matthew 1, 18 through 25, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, notice how the angel included his kinship to David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, Jehovah Savior. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means, Jehovah Savior. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jehovah Savior, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph had to be every bit as highly favored and blessed as Mary because Joseph received the revelation of the name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Joseph wasn't going to have an easy path to walk either. If he was going to be part of this plan, if he was going to be part of what God was doing, Joseph was going to have people snickering behind his back. Joseph was going to have people laughing at him. This fool married a girl who claims that God gave her a baby. This fool married a girl. She turned around and said her baby was born black because she took black pills. But 
But Joseph was as much willing as Mary to submit and to surrender to the plan of God. Why? Because Joseph wanted to live a life that brought glory to God. And Joseph understood God is in the interruptions. So if you're living today a life interrupted, thank God for it. God's using you to do something great. And something great will come to pass. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.